uh, Thunder Bay in Canada. He'll have the uh, with with uh, Donnie's performance and a bunch of others. There will be a tribute CD um, for, uh, tributing cool. um, Chris Oliva. So well, that's really great. More Thanks. info to follow on that. John's going to call on the hands, so raise the hand. Cycling. <laughs> he is the master of the, the pointing finger. Stuff. I can point. I can't play gutter ballet, but I can point. <laughs> okay, so ask away. Ask away. That was no, he's only, only 13. How you doing? <laughs> I've done a lot better since I met you in that hat. <laughs> Remember we took the picture with that hat, yep. right? But I actually have a question. Yeah. Out of all the albums, what's your favorite heavy song that you guys did, and what's your favorite ballad that you did? Favorite heavy song? And then your favorite ballad. Ooh, God, that's tough. For, for me, like, favorite heavy song is probably uh, Beyond the Doors of Star. <laughs> <laughs> and by far, Believe is, is, is the... Yeah. By the way, a song that, that Paul wrote, you know, which is in, in my, my work with I'll tell you, that to me is like one of the deepest, heaviest, like, ballad songs that, that I've heard. And that's my favorite, you know, ballad. Everyone else, well, they probably like, like, you He stole know. my heavy song. <laughs> <laughs> Ballads? Necrophilia? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Only you would say necrophilia. <laughs> I'm turning around. You don't, you. so you don't trust me, eh? <laughs> Where's the Pokemon no. card? Where's that? <laughs> Paul, they want to know what's your favorite ballad, favorite heavy song? Favorite Answer. ballad, unquestionably believe. Yeah. Yeah. We plotted that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Ghost in the Rose. Ghost in the Rose. Wow, that's, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. And, and, and Mr. Middleton? Hmm. I have to say Mr. because he's a... You know, he's one of the uh, upper echelon guys. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be careful with him because he's really stubborn. Heavy song. Hmm. Nasty in the morning. Think about that one. not like we yeah, have all the fucking answer. time in the world. I say Mountain King and probably believe. <laughs> all right, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When the crowds are yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Now, what's yeah, your favorite song be besides Godzilla or anything like that? <laughs> most. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, you gotta, you know, you gotta love it. Next question, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have I'll any tell you this. Oh, yes. I was reading on the website that you guys are doing something for Broadway. We are? Yes, yes. Well, we are. Actually, Paul will probably be able to answer that better than any of us because Paul knows what's going on. <laughs> Basically, what's going on is we sold Roland Oaks and Kate Spiakova, which is like one of the biggest Broadway producers. The only problem that's occurred is when John and I and Bob sold Roland Oaks, there was no such thing as Trans Siberian Orchestra. And then what's happened is Trans Siberian Orchestra has taken up all the time that we're supposed to be working on that on Broadway. But since TSO has had so much momentum, um, it's kind of been distracting, but as soon as we finish the um, next Sabotage album, we're going back to work on that. I think I question two parts. Yes. First, uh, what's with the new TSO album, and then you're going to be touring that in New York. Paul, you can probably get it. You can understand. Paul, there's no misunderstanding here. There's no misunderstanding. Basically, uh, Beethoven's last night is the next Trans-Siberian Orchestra album. Is 99% done. There's like four more days of mixing. There's only a 40% yeah. chance of that. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Though. You're gonna love it. It's really great. It's about it the night Beethoven. Really it's basically about the night Beethoven dies. It came out killer, and um, that should that will definitely be out in January. 
2004. I'm sorry. I like when you have the mic. This is great. This is great. We get paid for this, too. You're like, let Paul answer. Yes. I call him to his point. You did good at that. Great. First of all, Chris, I just want to say the time punk kicked that. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, they're playing today, so they're real pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and you should, if you're here with us, I mean, look yeah. at this. This, this is crazy. crazy. Yeah, this we have Paul, we have Ockles, we have How can I possibly We even have, have Johnny, I mean, <laughs> with really nice glasses. <laughs> <laughs> there is there any chance that either Dr. Butcher or Metallion would ever open up a set? you got to be shitting me, right? <laughs> It's like if, if Dr. Butcher was to open with Sabotage, first of all, I'd be dead of a heart attack. And he'd be the richest man in the world. Never gonna happen. Hey Paul, why don't we set up that Dr. Butcher Sabotage story? No, I don't think that I don't honestly I don't think that would happen, but you know, you never know. I mean, you know, we are family you know, prone to do stupid yeah. things and that would be that would be a pretty stupid one, so we'll probably try it again. Yes. I'm pointing. I'm pointing. Yeah, right. 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 I'm looking. It's only one hand at a time I can do that. <laughs> yes. What do you guys listen to right now? What do we listen to? Yeah, music wise. Right now I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> music wise? Yeah. Um ooh. Well, I tell you what, I'm very familiar with Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Cite that goddamn song to you backwards, <laughs> forwards, and sideways. But no, I, I mean, I listen myself personally. I listen to like classic rock stuff. Queen. Um, Sweet. I listen to John Deep Lee Purple. Purple. Snore. <laughs> Very musical. musical. <laughs> exactly. That was musical. And then you know, but no, I well, classic get, like, rock. Those weather yeah, tapes, you know, tapes. So he has to make a joke out of this, all right? It's like. I'm trying to be serious for once in my goddamn life. Queen, Pink Floyd, The Who, The Beatles. The Beatles were probably like, you know, the, the thing I listen to the most. I have every Beatles CD I bring with me everywhere I go, except when Al cracks them up and smashes them. <laughs> hey, I love the Beatles, especially when I want to hold your hand. You know, great. Love it. You know, splendid. <laughs> Are you believing anything I'm talking about? <laughs> I need a drink. You're not I believing was, anything. I was waiting for you to get to No, really, I mean, seriously, like, like, like Queen, Pink Floyd, The Who was a big, a big influence. You know, the Beatles, you know, and the later, you know, later Beatles stuff. And I just thought the Beatles were like incredible songwriters because, you know, it's like that was a band that you could put the record on and every song you sit there and go like, Fuck, they come up with these melodies. You sit there, you're like, God damn, hello? I mean, great stuff. Elton John, another brilliant, you know, brilliant stuff. Stuff like that. I don't know about these guys. They probably listen to, like, Lincoln Logs or something. <laughs> no, but I'm sure their influences are kind of the same. You, imagine, you drove 50 miles to sit here and look at me and go, like, I can't believe he's saying this. <laughs> I listened to what's the song on the, on Madden ninety or two thousand on the PlayStation, dun, 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 dun. and I listened to John try to learn Bohemian Rhapsody for two minutes. Pretty good. His fault. He, it was his idea. He's like, I got it, I got it, I got it down. And he's on the phone the next minute. Yeah, Paul's Bob Kinkle coming to Germany. <laughs> it's like Bob Kinkle's like my safety net. You know, it's like it's like when the guy's tight roping in the circus. It's like there's the net. Bob net. No net. It's like, it's like net. All right, if I fuck up, he's there. It's like it's great. You gotta love it. I mean, I can't even play gutter ballet. I wrote it. <laughs> Are you getting any of this? All Remember all this stuff. This is very important. Marcus, for can you still hear? Uh, <laughs> what? I remember the first time I went shopping at a mall with Steve Walker. Actually, I, I was with him when I got my ears pierced for the first time, and he had to like make me stand on a certain side of him because he can't hear out of one of his ears. <laughs> we killed. That was me and my brother. Me and my brother Chris. Oh, I got to tell you, me and my brother Chris tortured this poor man <laughs> for three years. We were like, listen. <coughs> 
take these broomsticks. We gave, we chopped up broomsticks and gave them to him to play and said, we can't fucking hear you. Use these. And then we surrounded him with all our amplifiers. And we were terrible, you know, back then. We couldn't even play smoke on the water. But it didn't matter as long as it was as loud as possible. And Steve was like, wow, shit. <laughs> and louder and louder. That's when we came, the guy came up with Dr. Kill drums then. Because it was like, he was hitting the drums so goddamn hard, they were breaking into pieces. And, and my brother Chris, I'll never forget it, God rest him, my brother Chris was like, I can't fucking hear you! I'm like, you can't hear him, then you're fucking dead. <laughs> Great stuff. You can't make shit like that up, right? <laughs> you haven't got one already? No. Oh. I didn't say anything. Anyway, next. Anyone? Anyone? What's going on with the new Dr. Butcher? New Dr. Butcher. Um, well, we we have it written, and we're waiting for for Paul and us to finish the new sabotage, and then Chris and I are going to go in and probably drink a lot and finish it. <laughs> it's very heavy and it's very fun and you're going to love it. Hopefully it'll come out soon. Probably within the next 10 years. <laughs> but we'll take advance orders now. <laughs> so money up front. <laughs> Only cash though. No. <laughs> <laughs> Send your money orders to I'm John sorry, right, right in front of the the I just, I wanted to say, you said a little bit ago when we were talking about how did they come up with the right. I mean, how do you guys come up with your stuff? I'm sitting in a car. <laughs> you really want to know. <laughs> you really want to know. <laughs> it's basically a, a, a deep-seated fear of having to get a real job one day. <laughs> <laughs> it drives us. Do you really want to know the truth? We sit there at Paul's house, and I sit there at the piano, or Al, or Al, or, or Chris, or whatever, and Paul sits there at the TV hitting buttons, going like, da 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 I'm like, that sounds great! <laughs> and you know what? It fucking works! I'm just like, dick, I can't believe you did this, and you're not watching TV! That's what we do. No, actually, in all honesty, Paul's great at coming up with melody ideas, and we kind of bounce them off of each other. <laughs> 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 no, in all honesty, you know, Paul, actually, all the guys involved in Sabotage are, 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 are good songwriters in their own right. They have their own different styles, which is cool. Chris, I mean, come on, you can't, can't get is that like heavy metal personified or what? <laughs> and Chris is just like, I hate the world. <laughs> so it's like, with Chris, it's like, great, if we need something heavy, I just like, Chris, go like, fuck you. <laughs> Al is more like sophisticated writer. Al plays some of them like, okay, well, that's really cool. Then after like a half a bottle of vodka is gone between the two of us, we sit there like, that's great, we love it. And then he's just sitting there going like, I'm not going to argue with these two guys, so they're going to kick my ass. See, now you're talking about the same guy with the poor Jeff. So you have these nutty, go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, well, that was the first right. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't I said, remember that. Very sophisticated, man. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's like with Sabotage, everyone's got, it's like an open form and everyone contributes in their own Honestly, community. one of the great things about the band is, you know... Why are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> a smart one. Hey, no one comes into the world. <laughs> exactly. Everybody in the band has a lot of talent. Everybody fills in a certain... And like usually, one person's missing, somebody else will come up with. And it's just... There's a lot of short stops in the band. Usually, really most of us are missing. The lead was taken when we weren't looking, though. <laughs> <laughs> I get blamed for everything else that goes wrong. Now I'm a criminal. <laughs> Listen, I haven't stole a song in two days. <laughs> Come on. Hey, John, find someone. I'm finding someone. Look, watch this guy right here. Boom. This is for uh, Paul. I just wanted to know, besides Sabotage and the One Metal Church album, have you ever written for any other bands? No, besides no Trans Siberian Arts? Uh, Badlands, um, Van Gogh-Bowman. A number of bands over the years, but. Uh, Honestly, one of the reasons like we settled down with Sabotage and trans Siberian Orchestra is just, especially Sabotage, <laughs> is, um, it's, I love John O'Leary. <laughs> 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 
It's a mad crush. There you go. No, it's um the great thing is because I produced a number of bands before Sabotage, but the great thing about Sabotage is anything that you can imagine musically, they can do. And you know, it's for a while that was producing bands where they send you down and you meet with bands and you say like this play a D minor seventh chord and give me this blank stare like huh? You know, and it's like really scary. He says it now and I look at Al. Yeah. <laughs> hey Al, what's up? <laughs> I remember God. Me, me and Al were doing an interview for a Japanese guitar magazine, <laughs> and they're going over our guitar solos, and they're like, can you explain this solo? And Al's like, no. I was doing a Phrygian mode, a, a, a Lydian, and a scale, and here and there, and they look at me like, Chris, what about this song? I'm like, well, my one finger was here. <laughs> Some guy one time asked me, he goes, he goes, man, he goes, you write some great songs. He's like, can you read music? I'm like, fuck no, I have no idea what the fuck. It's like, you just do it, you know? So, I don't know. Never mind. Steve, you're next. Pick someone. Break the ball. All right, so I guess I speak for everyone. I'm saying, when is Sabotage going to be back? When are we going to see him live, the new album, and everything? No, Zach's in Florida. He has some stuff to do, and we were lucky to get Johnny up, which was uh, really great. Yes. And, and Al out of Long Island. Yeah. 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 In all seriousness, just for two seconds, we can't thank you guys all enough for coming down because I know some people come. Yeah, I got to really thank you guys. Thank you. It's really, really cool that you guys all did this. It's like we're like I'm blown away. I'm sitting there going like Jesus Christ. This is I mean, honestly, it's better than the money. Don't tell the labels that, but it, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my I think wife. they're here. <laughs> I think she's at the mall. <laughs> this is probably with my wife at the mall. <laughs> anyway, yeah, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right there. Right, I got Paul oh, on the new metal church masterpiece. Yes. They give you credit for nutter butters and converters. Well, it's um, Kurt, Kurt has a, a dog that I, I would always eat. When we did the last album, we always had a lot of nutter butters piled all over the council. And um, so we shipped out a case of the last album. You know, health food, you know, has the same nutritional value as like the daily news. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Al, John, we'll be back over here. Yo. Yo. Oh, man. Yeah, I like uh, your old stuff, like Sirens and Dungeons and Calling. You guys remember that Retro 80s thrash when you guys came out? Like, the what year was that? <laughs> I, I don't remember that. I mean, you know, that was like a great time because the thing was, is like Steve, Steve and, and myself and my brother, I mean, we were just like, we were a bunch of kids. We were just sitting there going like, what the fuck are we gonna do? So we were just like, whatever, and we came up with like sirens. I remember us writing the sirens record and sitting there in the in this. We had this rehearsal place that was classic. I mean, it was like a shitty rat infested hole that we called the pit with like a parachute for like a, a roof. And it was like, but you know, we came up with that. We were like, man, there's got to be something here, and. Um, no one, you know, no one gave a shit. We were stuck in Florida, you know, we were like, wow, we're never, no one's ever going to, and this one guy heard it, and he, you know, took, you know, the time to, like, get it out to people, and then everyone liked it. We were, like, blown away. I mean, we were just kids out of high school, actually. We were Wait. kids thrown out of high school. <laughs> I got a diploma. Well, you weren't thrown out, right? You were, Steve was like the only one that like actually graduated. I got thrown out for lighting the vice principal on fire with a cigarette. It was a total fucking accident, I swear to God. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what my dad said. He's like, what did you do? I said, I lit him on fire. It was a mistake. One of those shirts that caught on fire. It wasn't my fault. I flipped a cigarette and he went up. And he said, they're going, Oliva, you're fucking out of here. I may be out of here, but you're on fire. <laughs> you better throw my at My dad just looked at me and was like, get a job. I was like, I'm going to go play in a band. And I started playing in a band. But that period of time was a very, very cool period of time. Because we, we were just like finding out. It was like the first time we started writing music and stuff. And be honest with you, when I listen to it nowadays, I think it's fucking terrible. But... <laughs> But it's, it, you know, if you think about it and you see the evolution of how the band evolved over the years, especially after we, we hooked up with Paul, 
Uh, up until we hooked up with Paul, we were very, very raw. And we just didn't really give a rat's ass what it, you know, we didn't give a shit. And, but Paul was the one that gave us the confidence to like, you know, try to explore other things with like orchestrations and words the keywords. Letters, you know, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> words more than, you know, words that meant more than, fuck you, this Cyrus <laughs> that shit. It was like, I was like, whenever I needed a word and I couldn't think of any right thing, I was just like, what am I going to do here? Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> Think of that shit. I was like, I, I couldn't think of anything else to say, so I just went, ah, great. When I was growing up, it was I was into like Slayer, Celtic Cross, Possessed. When you guys came out, I was like, wow, it's cool. Some of the mellower bands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that you know you're doing different stuff. You're still around. I mean, a lot of those guys are. It's weird that we're still around. We should have probably been shot off the face of the earth years ago. But hell no. I don't know. You know what it is about sabotage. I think the thing about sabotage is with all the shit that we've gone through, we've gone through a lot of shit. We're just too lazy to pay attention. To what we're yeah, we're just. We're just <laughs> I think what, what sabotages what happened is, is is we've never really, except for one year, all right, we all know what year that was, fight for the nightmare, okay, go, give me the boo-hoo right now. Yeah, well, you know, believe me, you, you, you had to be there to believe it. You want this? I mean, but we never really, like, conform, you know, we never really, like, changed our approach to things it's like even this present lineup of sabotage it's like you know we've never really like tried to like jump on what you know what the trend is or anything like that we just do it well it's like there's no you know if you're going to follow that you're going to end up falling off you know because all those bands that were doing that that followed that trend thing they're all gone and they used to make i'll tell you there's a lot of bands they used to make fun of us back in like the, the late 80s early 90s oh you guys dinosaur rock oh blah 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 but they're all fucking gone and sabotage is still here thanks to a lot of alcohol and paul's bank account <laughs> I'll like it. But, you know, that's, you know, all stealing the mic. I'll just say, there's one thing that was important with Sabotage, and I think the reason they're so, <coughs> bands either grow or they die. If you keep remaking the same album over and over and over again, you can see bands like from the past, I'll let, I'll let remain nameless, where they just yeah, keep... Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. You used word a lot better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, education. <laughs> I'm just glad you guys don't jump on any trendy bandwagons. Like nowadays, a lot of people are just finding a trend and then we'll jump on it, and then radio kills the songs, and then all of a sudden it's burned out. People are saying, hey, I'm sick of this, you know? I like a band that's steady and still around. That's why you guys have, have a lot of respect for you guys. So. I, I think one of the things, though, is that if you do music you believe in, eventually the fans and the money and all that other stuff will come. If you try to chase the trends and the money, it never comes, you know? Or if it does, it's just like winning a lottery. Yeah. So we're not doing that Ricky Martin song? No, the Ricky Martin song. <laughs> about those bands? Those bands, and would you have a tour with them? I know you did a festival. We did a show with Dream Theater. We toured with Face Warning. Yeah, we toured with Face Warning like a long time ago. We did a long tour with them. I think we ruined their lives. I don't think they're together, are they? I don't think they're together. Is Face Warning still Yeah, yeah, right. They survived touring with us. God bless that guy, because I know I got to hammer many of them. <laughs> I mean, we'll tour with anybody if the, you know, the situation's right, the bands get along, you know, and basically we get along with any, any kind of band, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. it's just a matter of... That's a great band. They're great musicians. Yeah. Well, yeah. What band is yeah. Oh, great musicians. Really great musicians. I mean, we're actually fans. We played with the Monsters of Rock. Well, I just did a show with them in Brazil well, not that long ago. I'm oh, sorry, Jason, you had a question? Um, yeah, uh, kind of a two-part, I suppose. Uh, two yeah. parts. Well, <laughs> one is, um, you guys, like you were just talking about, like, all the albums kind of changing and sounding a little different, almost like a, like a new band, a fresh sound. Where do you vision the sound? I mean, you, th you look at Edge of Doors and Streets, 
And every every album has a beautiful, distinct sound that you know differentiates each other. Where do you you know? And it's a lot of you guys, Paul and John, probably. Where do you? Where does this inspiration come from? How do you know when you achieve that sound? Stole a Schneider. Honestly, oh, I, I, don't, I think it just kind of happens. And it's, it's everyone in the band, I think, basically, you know, it just comes into the uh, picture in the end. And honestly, we don't think about it. It just kind of happens. But you, you are aware that you have to try to beat or grow from the next album. So every, like, like guitar sounds, everyone is like, people on the, on the site go, like, how do you achieve the guitar sound? How do you get the Chris sound? It's like, they're all different. You know, I don't so think, we, we don't sell our we stuff every year. year. <laughs> are you saying Chris Olivas? I mean, whatever, all the guitar, whatever parts, a lot of, I guess the majority of us are guitar players, so, you know, everybody's asking, yeah, how, do you, how do you, I when do you choose your knob into an <laughs> It's also, I think, also because, you know, the membership has grown a lot, too. I mean, you know, because from Mountain King, you know, afterwards, you know, Chris came on board, because the music started to get so complicated, you needed a second guitarist. And then after the unfortunate demise of, of course, Chris Olivas, which was a tragedy that nearly ended the band, and then, you know, Alex Skolnick was there for a while, which he was a great guitar player, but that was just a temporary thing, and because he had his own projects to move on to. And then we were really lucky to bump into uh, Uncle Al. We must have auditioned like a hundred times. Uncle Al! Yeah. Uncle Al. We must have auditioned like a hundred times. And, true story about Al Petrone, just for anyone who hasn't heard it, that was like, we, we, we got Chris Cowell. Yeah. He had Chris, and that was Bar? like... <laughs> These sliders waiting outside for you. Yeah. Hey, uh, everyone wants to kick my ass. <laughs> I think it's after me too, Cowboy actually. Killer. All right, part two. Okay, now, is there anything that you've recorded that maybe you're not very particular <laughs> in what it sounds like? Maybe, maybe if it's a song on an album or something like that. Like Streets, I think it's Streets, right? Is like one of your albums. Every one of them is done a little different from the other Streets one. Streets was a real special Streets record. Was there was something about Streets that had this... Like, as far as, I don't know about what Paul thinks, but as far as I, I'm concerned, like, when my brother was alive, that was when, you know, that was the peak of Paul and, and my brother and working together. And I think that was like, you know, we, we worked on that record for a year. Actually, I left before the record was done because he wanted me to stay. I was like, fuck this, I'm gone. It was like a year, I was like, it's, we're, we're done, you know, what else here? He's like, this is mixed 32... A of like believe I'm like 32A. Are you out of your fucking mind? You know, but that's the thing. It's like, but in all honesty, I'm making a joke. But in all honesty, Paul would hear things that I was just so burnt at that time. It's like, you know, the song of what's it? A little too far. Never heard it. No. All right. That I, it was just piano and vocal. That, that is great. Right. Did you guys. I think so, right? Gotta yeah. get back. Oh yeah, yeah. Gotta get back. Gotta get back. Wherever we're going. <laughs> but the thing was, where is like we did that song once, and and I think we got it on what the second take. This is a true story, and because John we had to play the, we I had to play it. We, had, we sing flew it in a time. German Steinway, a Hamburg Steinway, because we wanted that sound. It was like, like two thousand dollars a day. It was like ridiculous, <laughs> and then John had to play the song and sing it perfectly because the piano would lead into his vocal mic, so you had to get yeah, it in one take. You had take. to get it once. Normally we take like 12 tracks of vocals, bounce them down 12 feet. We couldn't do it with us. <laughs> so John nailed it in the second take. And unfortunately, the engineer at the time stored all these no, vocals. He uh, fucked it up. He screwed it up. <laughs> I did it 300 times. Then he had to do it 300 more times to do it right. I was right. like so sick of that goddamn song. I was like, you know what? This song, I hate this <laughs> oh, no. But when it was done, I was like, you know what? <coughs> you know, it came out great. But we went from doing it in two takes to taking like, oh, what was it like? I don't, you know what? It's literally like I don't even want it. I remember seeing a a, a hand truck go out of the studio with like six racks of tapes on it said a little too far, a little too far, a little too far. Like, little too far. I'd say it's a way too far. You know? But it's like that was the record. I think that was where, you know, we were at our working together with my brother when he was still alive. That was like the peak. You're right, yeah. Yes. What would you consider your most complex song concerning instrumentation and orchestration? <laughs> now he's seized up. We're gonna have to reboot him. <laughs> Gutter ballet, flex, like that has the most things going on, the most you know instrumentation, the most orchestration, and like the newer stuff. Right? Some with the vocals, probably chance. Like chance, definitely chance. One child, Wake Magellan. 
Wake of Gel. Wake of Gel was probably like hourglass. One of those. Hourglass was another one that was like. I mean, hourglass is like we're sit, doing that live. You're sitting there going like, "Come on, <laughs> run away!" Then all that. Yeah. Like, all the smokers and older people give me the parts with all the like tons of lyrics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like 130 like, degrees oh, on stage. I'm going Columbus and Magellan and a gun. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, okay, we can't do that. Dump that part on Catherine. <laughs> Chris, you do this. Me and I were sitting there with a cigarette going like, Chance! <laughs> Chance! <laughs> and it was like, and we're sitting there looking, he's like, he's got his veins are like popping out of his head. And me, Al, me and Al, because Al's on my side of the stage, so we have this like thing sitting there. It's like our side of the stage is kind of like a bottle club, all right? It's like we're sitting, you, we're sitting there looking at poor Chris, and his veins are like popping out of his head, and, and Zach and him are like, oh, Magama and Magellan, and we're sitting there going like, I can't believe it. Like, chin. Take a chin. You know. Yeah, Probably I'm Wake Him and John was complicated, okay, yes. Um, I'm hearing the new album is going to be a lot heavier. Is, is that just the sound you always want to get back to after doing like more melodic albums? Or is that just like maybe some of the fans just saw what want more? Well, I just think it's just, you know, we just want to have some fun on this, you know. I mean, we, you know, work hard on these records and, and all the concept stuff. It's, it's a long process and I think with this new Sabotage record, we just want to go back and have a good time and have some fun and and you know the stuff on the new Sabotage record is very very heavy and it's very cool and you guys are gonna love it. Yeah. 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 Psych! Uh, uh, hopefully uh, February now? What? Wally we're all dead! <laughs> Yeah, February seems good. Yeah, well, uh, with a little luck, hopefully it'll be out in February. Oh, yeah. It's gonna. Be, you guys are gonna like it. If you like, it, it's very cool. The stuff that we're writing right to? now that we're working on, we're really excited about it, and it's, and it's really good stuff. And it's definitely a different. It's different than like Wake and, and Dead Winter Dead. It's more, way more aggressive, way more pissed off because you know we're pissed off at everything. But, <laughs> but it's it's good. You know, you guys are gonna like it. It's very what you guys want. We're doing this for you guys. Buy the damn thing. I got tickets to the Yankee game. I got some Really? Can I have those? Two questions. One got brought up a lot of speaking of this one. You guys have had the same lineup now for this is going to be the third album. Give it about fucking amazing, right? I finally found guys who could drink with me and not die. Musically, how does it feel to be with the same amount of players? Any, like, uh, no, it's way better. It, it's way better, especially since everyone contributes to parks and everything else like that. And I mean, it's um, we have the two old timers here, of course, and we, we miss Steve. We Love really do. We do. Shit. Sure about that. Why don't you tell the truth? It's like Caffrey, no one can drink better than Alan Chris. <laughs> and they, but they can still do it in Everything. I can't. He's amazing. I actually saw him once drink an entire quart of Stoll Schneier and go on stage. That was and he was, the second and he was one. yeah, he was that was the second one too. But now that now he's, he's a reformed uh, yeah. Yeah. man. Yeah. I don't, I don't so drink any more. So now it's only one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Don't drink any less either. But. This is John. What he's drinking? Uh oh. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> the keyboards hold him up. <laughs> in his eyes, he's looking at the piano, he's like, black keys, white keys, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 On a gutter ballet tour, he used to play mentally yours, and that was my gauge for how drunk he was, because the more he drank, the slower the beginning got. So he, was like, he was up there, didn't drink, and I was like, Timmy went out, but there was some nights, it's like, Timmy was crawling out there. <laughs> Okay, well, I have a bad reputation for drinking hardened fucking beans. I'm having a good time at this, all right? Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with Let's it. Let's have fun with this. Well, now, ever since uh, Monsters of Rock last year, the band has been dubbed Sobertage. Yep, yes. Sobertage. We don't drink before the show at all. Well, yeah. That's tough. <laughs> you have no 
fucking guy to get how tough that is. But we have, and, and that's honest, that's the truth. a world of because difference. Because it it's made a, a world of difference. Because I'll be honest with you guys, I've gone up on stage at times where I didn't even know what the keyboard was. <laughs> so like, oh, okay, this? <laughs> but, you know, we got to the point where it's like, you know, we had like some experiences. Like, we were like, you know, we're, we're ripping off people doing you this. You so well? Who? Oh, those guys, yeah, that was... Just anyway, then you <laughs> anyway, anyway, you know, you just, you know, we, we, you know, we, you know, you have to like stay sober and do the show, and then after the show, then you know, you have fun and do whatever you want. Why are you that, talking? When you guys, uh, you guys become way too important to us, and we figured if we take it serious and work real hard, then you guys will stay with us. Because I've only been in the band four years, and I can't believe the following that he developed over the last what, fifteen years. Eighteen, eighteen years, yeah, twenty. <laughs> that wasn't even meant by that. That was like some love. Can I have your checkbook with you? Oh, let's see. You better have it with you. No, I mean, it's, it, it, Al's right. I mean, that's like something that, it, you know, in all honesty, it's like a lot of times I've looked at videos and stuff that we've done and yeah, 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 jolly, jolly. There's lots of good times and we had fun where, you know, he's swimming across the stage on a guitar coffin and shit like that. Or, yeah, or, 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 or you know, or kicking someone's ass in the first row. But, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you got to the point where it's like, you know, this is like not going to work. And, and, and we really decided that, you know, the show is like, we're going to come out there, we're going to do some, what, you don't believe me? I believe you. No, well, you get to places, you get to places where a kid saves like eight months, all yeah, of his you, money you that you he has, like, to go see the show, the last thing you want to do is watch us go up there right. and be drunk, you, you want to do that, you go to Queens. Right, exactly. <laughs> But you go to like Budapest and the guy's like, like he said, saved his money for like six months since the show. You know, and it's, I started getting like a really guilt trip and, and I don't give a shit about anything, but it started bothering me because I was like, you know, what, what am I doing here? You know, but Al, actually Al was the one that actually started that whole thing. Al like looked at me and said like, you're a mess. I was like, I know. What do we do? He said, let's not drink before the show. I was like, okay. And everything was great since then. But it's worked, you know, really well for us. And we only drink twice as much as that. for you. Yeah, I said it for 10 years. No one listened. You have to have the voice of reason. The voice of power. It's like, John, don't drink. Johnny, fuck you. What are you going to do when that happens? And you're gonna sit there and you're like, well, what am I gonna do? Beat him up? I don't think so. so. No, it's pretty easy to fix. You just get all the beer and the booze after the show. Yeah. He's good at that. No bottles backstage. No. We're like, me and I are sitting there going, fuck, where's the vodka? <laughs> it's not till it's after in the Poland Spring bottle. It's in the Poland Spring <laughs> bottle. <laughs> Streets was supposed to originally be like twenty something tracks, right? Right. Now I know I know everybody in here can agree with me. Streets fucking rock. Right. Right. Yeah. It was ten tracks. Are you guys ever gonna re-release it? I know you put out like other tracks and other albums. Make the original, complete, exact streets all twenty six of them. Well, if the record company didn't lose all the tapes, we probably would. Oh, yeah, there's, awesome. a, there's a problem that I think some of you are aware of. Basically, Streets was the first 96-track album ever done, which was two 48-track machines slaved together, and the reels were unusually big. And basically what happened was they went into the Atlantic Vaults, which is this huge warehouse that has like every outtake from every great band Atlantic ever has, which is pretty impressive. It's like Led Zeppelin, Genesis, I mean, it's just, you know, Rolling Stones, it's amazing. Didn't lose any of their fucking But the problem, <laughs> was, the problem was the label has lost the outtakes from Sabotage oh, on, on that Christ. album. Which Remake, is, renew. Which hey, has Steve, some classic you, Chris Are they available through Steve Wackles on eBay? Yeah, no. <laughs> You still lose. <laughs> that that like sucks because there was some great stuff that that my brother played on that's like we you know it's gone. One day like, they turn up, but I mean we really tried. Yeah. We went down to the warehouse. We looked. We actually offered people yeah, yeah. work in the warehouse a thousand dollars if they find it. Oh, constrictor. Or something. Yeah. It was like that was like you know. You can't. I mean Atlantic has been great to this band. I mean basically they've given them complete freedom. Yeah. What are you really? 
really think about that. I love this crowd. We're all going out partying after this. Now do you believe me? But basically, they've always given us pretty much unlimited budgets, and we, which we've always gone over. And, they've always <laughs> <laughs> and, and how much do you make back? Tens of thousands of them? Yeah, Actually, the band just okay, because not only that, they gave the band the free overseas, <laughs> which is, uh, has turned out to be very lucrative. Is that the word, Al? For who? <laughs> yeah. He stands on the fifth. I'll tell you what. <laughs> that's what I am. Yeah. No, I love them. I'm sorry, go ahead. Is there anyone here from Atlantic? No. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> good. <laughs> I'm behaving. No one's gonna tell. <laughs> They're on our fucking side. They're not gonna tell. Not like hey, but if y'all are like, sick of playing, like live or something. Sick of playing. Got around. Oh yeah, we're yeah. <laughs> He's sick of playing sirens. <laughs> if I have to play sirens one more time, I'm gonna have to hurt somebody. You never get sick of playing because of you guys. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for you guys, we'd be working. Forget about. It. We'd be working. We'd be saying. Building would you like ketchup with those fries, sir? <laughs> we'd be saying, would you like ketchup with fries? Sir? Yes. 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 I'm like, no, it's like you guys, microphone. it's like for you guys. I want to play with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> See, the amazing thing is, shush. Okay. 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 <laughs> no, the amazing thing is that no matter how many places we've been to, there's still like a million places we haven't been. You know, we get mail from like Australia and other places in yeah, Chicago, other places in South America and stuff like that. And every time we wind up touring, like the first time we went to South America last year, we went and did Sabotage's first ever acoustic show. We want to talk about six really nervous guys. We were like, we didn't know what was going to happen. But, we didn't even know the song. <laughs> but I mean, to show up down there, then we did the electric show and there's like 3,500 people in a show that we never even been there. We didn't know anybody there. Or the first time we went to Greece and the place was sold out or the first time you go anywhere. And one thing I learned about Sabotage fans are pretty much the same everywhere. They've just got like different color hair. And, and <laughs> I was laughing the first time we played in Greece because there was absolutely no blonde people. I'm going to Johnny. I'm like, there's not one blonde person. <laughs> Well, there were you two guys. Right. <laughs> then I jumped in, like an idiot. I jumped in, and I went back. He jumped was, like, in the crowd, came back with almost his shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> they tried. They took everything but his boots. He's like, like, I, I think I left. fucked up by jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, are you alright? He's like, I have one leg. Like, what are you fucking doing? He's like, well, I'm like, dude, are you crazy? <laughs> What, what did we do? That's right, we were sitting there laughing at him. <laughs> Look at this fucking, he's out of his fucking head. He jumped into that. That's like jumping into a fucking there's shark a better one. Pit. The best one was we were playing with Testament in San Francisco, and he jumps into the crowd surfing around. Oh, they threw they him out of the building. Stage the he's out sitting on the curb going. Yeah, they, they threw I'm me out of the club, and I'm like getting carried out by this store. I'm in the band. I'm in the band. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sitting on the sidewalk outside San Francisco like this. I hear sirens. God's on it. Sirens. And, and we're up there going, where the fuck is Catherine? It's like, is he down there? We're like looking into the pit. These guys are like, kill him. Like, oh, fuck. I hope he's not down there. He's fucking out in front of the fucking place sitting on the curb. I'm like, well, tough encore for you, right? <laughs> you know, they threw me out, you know? They threw I snuck back in, though. My tour manager came out to, like, talk to security guards, like, crawled underneath them. Like, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing out here? Are you supposed to be in there? And like, I think so. Am I getting paid? But get it. <laughs> <laughs> we've had some memorable moments on stage. God believe well, we can we've remember. had some memorable moments. You remember. <laughs> that was my next question. What's one of your most memorable yeah, times on the road. Most memorable times oh, on the road. God. Bank <laughs> We want to bring that up now. Steve might be still in trouble with the law. <laughs> uh, about uh, Washington. About Washington. Washington. I'll tell you what. Wait. wait. <laughs> on the last tour in America, we did did a few shows in America before we went to Europe. This is and God. This is the God's honest truth. It was the 
most unbelievable thing that ever happened in my life. <coughs> Me and Al are sitting at the front of the bus. Everyone else is sleeping. It's like 7 o'clock in the morning. We're watching Caddyshack. <laughs> completely drunk out of our fucking minds. Going like, I love my job. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the bus driver, like, all of a sudden, we're like, looking. this car goes... <laughs> blows past us, right? We're like, what the fuck's going on? All of a sudden we see like 12 police cars following him. And we're sitting there looking out at the bus driver, all of a sudden the guy threw out a bag, he had like a garbage bag, right? He throws out, he has a garbage bag full of money. I was like, you gotta, we're musicians, okay? Money is the first word in the fucking dictionary. I mean, everything else is meaningless, all right? All of a sudden it's like this guy throws out a bag of money. I mean, a, a rather oh, large bag of money, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like flying against the bus, and I'm just like, MONEY! <laughs> the whole interstate went like, Arr! Our bus driver's like, our, One of our t-shirt guy runs out of the bus in his underwear, you know, <laughs> pecker flopping everywhere, <laughs> in a pair of socks, and, and everyone's like picking up money off the street. They're, Remember, you and me ran out, it's like, you got like a little bit, I'm sitting there going like, this is too fucking good to be true. Right? I'm picking up money, I'm going like, oh, I'm going to get busted and go to jail. Jail, absolutely a negative. In, in John Oliva's words, jail is not a good place. So I'm like, I got scared. I was like, fuck this, I'm getting back on the bus. But all these guys are like, and all the whole interstate, they were all stopped and picking up money. You know, it's money. I mean, we're talking, guys, we're talking mega amounts of fucking money here. Like, we're not talking about like a pocket full of money. We're talking about a whole goddamn truck full of money everywhere. And, and the kind and generous John Oliva never woke me up, no. <laughs> hey, I opened the door to the back of the bus and, and like, I said, MONEY! <laughs> and only one guy ran out, yeah. and me and Al ran out. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I was like, you're all on your fucking own, I'm out of it. And for the same reason that they give me like all the lyrics, they know I can run the fastest, so by me they were like, MONEY. <laughs> but to make a long story short, the thing that was funny was our sound man, had an arm, I mean, we're, we're talking an a arm full of money. He had to have 30 grand. And he's walking and all of a sudden the cops, they blocked off behind the bus, they blocked off the interstate. I'm sitting there looking like, oh, this is gonna get bad. There's money everywhere. I'm talking, guys, we're talking money everywhere. He's got this arm full of money, he's running to the bus and all of a sudden he came around the one side of the bus and there was a cop standing right there going, I hope you were bringing that to us, right? <laughs> He's like, die, da, da, yeah, da, da. And it was like, it was like we were in the middle of a bank robbery. It was the most intense thing, but it was like something you can't make that shit up. I'll never forget that. It was like Caddyshack. All I remember was like, and then he was on the fourth hole, and it was like money. Boom. <laughs> Greatest road story, that is of all the road stories except for me killing people or something like that, was like the best. I'm sure the cops turned the money into evidence. Oh yeah, I'm sure they were like, you know, hey, should we turn this in? Well, fucking, I need a new car. <laughs> There's no cops here. <laughs> Oh, the dwarf? Sh the dwarf. All right. Uh -oh. No, Paul. All right. You're not going to talk about drugs. Or drugs. <laughs> All right. Not that that would bother me. This is the best story, I think. Or they got a billion, but you guys got to do me one huge favor. If you could turn off the yeah. VCRs. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I love they, you. One, one of the problems we have is just basically that there's so many projects and they're just backing into one another one at a time. And, I mean, luckily with this team here, we're able to like. I mean, we're trying to get out two albums a year, but even that's really an, an insane schedule. And a, a Broadway project would just wipe out albums for like a year or two, and that would be a, you know, a bad thing at this moment. So the first Broadway thing will be wrong about, theoretically. Okay. Is this the implicit material? Oh, actually, this question was for John. I just want to know how you got involved in uh, singing the theme song for WWF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You want to... Give me six grand for one day and I'll sing you your fucking back. <laughs> no, actually, because it, it, that's just a joke. In all honesty, it's because of the money and what they were doing, it was all for charity. It was all for cri My father is crippled, has been crippled his whole life. And the money that they were raising for that was going to, you know, crippled children and stuff like that. And, and that's why I did it. I'll tell you what, I had such a great time with those guys. They loved me. They were like, like, 
everyone else sucks. You you are so cool. You're hanging out like like Kevin Nash, who's like that is one big motherfucker. <laughs> I met the Undertaker first, and I thought he was big. I was like, wow, this is a big guy. Then I met Kevin Nash, and I was like. <coughs> This guy is a real <laughs> guy. But they, we had a really good time with them. And they were like Paul Tug. They were perfect, perfect. gentlemen. They were so kind, so you classy. Know. Another thing we learned, when you walk down A Street in the village with six guys that are over seven feet tall, <laughs> everyone gets out of your way. <laughs> it was great. I went, I did part of the video shoot was I went to church with The Undertaker <laughs> in a taxi cab. I was sitting there in a taxi cab with The Undertaker. He's like, we're going to church. I'm like, Fucking cool. <laughs> what, are we, what are we gonna do there? He's like, I'm gonna walk up to the wall and I'm gonna make believe like I'm like just looking around going like that and you just stand there and just do whatever you do. I'm like, well I can't do that because we'll probably get arrested. <laughs> what am I gonna fucking do? So I'm standing there looking at this guy, I'm going like, God, this guy is so fucking big. <laughs> it's like I'm a big guy. This guy make me look like a fucking dwarf. I'm sitting here going like Hey man. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> but no, they were really great guys, and all the money that went for that went to, you know, crippled children and stuff, which was a great thing. And they were perfect gentlemen and stuff, and plus they give us free tickets to all the wrestling shit. <laughs> oh, it's so cool, man. We went to titty bars with them and stuff. It was cool. I felt never felt safer in my entire life. I'm like, I'm surrounded by Kevin Nash and The Undertaker. I'm like, fuck you! <laughs> What? I don't give a shit how big. Fuck you. Hey, these guys are. Okay, one more question now. I'm just wondering why things like sabotage and metal music is more popular in Europe than it is in the States. Corporate radio. People drink more there. I think it's a combination of things. I think MTV turned music for a long time very bad driven as opposed yeah. to music was driven. Yeah. And I think in the long term it may have hurt music for the, uh, especially for the 80s and 90s because. <coughs> Image can take you only so far, then the music, that's why a lot of these bands don't do catalog, that's why a lot of them don't tour. I mean, if you look at the big touring bands, most of them are from the past, and, yeah. which is a shame. This is when I was younger, which was a long time ago. I mean, oh, the very long time ago. <laughs> Only kidding. The biggest touring bands were the current bands, and as opposed to now, the biggest touring bands like Pink Floyd and stuff like that. So it's, uh, I think music's been hurt, but I think the pendulum is swinging the other way. And another thing that I think is hurt is that it used to be in the old days that um, you were big in America, you were big all over the world. And that changed like in the 90s. And I remember asking someone named Masahito why grunge rock and alternative... Masahito's the like, biggest DJ in Japan. I said, why aren't the bands that are like grunge rock or alternative that are huge in the States big over here? Great he, goes, he goes, oh, poor, the Japanese kids look at this as American wine rock. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say one thing about the European audiences, and this is like, I mean, we're, you know, we're obviously we're from America, and we, you know, but the thing about the European audiences, is that I found that that they are, they are very very musically educated. I agree. And yeah. I'll tell you what, it's like if when you play there, they'll go crazy and stuff, and and but you better, you better do be your good. shit right because <laughs> if you don't, they're sitting there like yep. after show comes, you go, you sang the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, but yeah, will. You know, I but get people giving me like old live tapes of songs that Chris Leva played. Travis, this is the way you were supposed to play. He played it in this one show in Norway live like this in 1982. I'm like, I was not there. <laughs> but no, the thing is, it's like in, in Europe, it's like in Europe, it's like it was like here in like the early 80s, late 70s, as far as like concerts were like. Uh, a thing to go to was like a thing to do. See, they don't have everything over there that we have here. A concert to them over there is like that's like, hey, this is my fucking weekend. They save up for that the ticket for two months. They plan it. They'll drive five, six hours. Like uh, Johnny was saying, but they will. They'll drive like five, six hours to come. It's an event for them. Here in America, it's like we have e so much of everything. They're like, yeah, fuck, I'll turn on MTV. If I don't see it on MTV, yeah, yeah I'll go. You know. It's also, I think, that as music yeah. has gotten shallower, it, it ceases to have an impact in the people's lives. Which is one of the reasons why you can tell if music is having an impact in someone's lives is, number one, the band can tour. Because if music affects you that much, you go see them live. And number two, 10 years from now, 
the albums will still be out there, people will still be buying them. Which is why, like The Who, can still sell out Chase Stadium 25 years after they put out an album. It's why Pink Floyd can sell out Chase Stadium 10 times 25 years later. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, you know, that's it's something to strive for. It's what, hopefully, I think it's what sabotage Do we get a lot of people that have never, ever, ever seen the band before live that'll be bringing their kids to the shows? You know, they've been sabotage fans for forever, you know, and they'll be bringing them for the first time. So I think having the same kind of, and not, not like ever changing our music and just being sabotaged throughout the years gave us the chance to be around <laughs> long enough to be able to meet our following. I mean, because if we were changing and changing with the times and losing fans and trying to pick up ones here and there, we never would have developed something strong enough where we went somewhere there would be people that, I mean, there may not be eight million people that own any one sabotage record, but if you added up all the people around the world that have a sabotage record, it's a lot more than a lot of fucking bands out there have sold them. And we've learned that, that you know, we can go to these places and play for a whole lot of people. That's why. It's very true, though. It is true. It's true. It's it's. You know, we'll be up there. Like, we'll be up there playing in front of a hundred thousand people, headlining in front of bands that have sold like ten million copies of a record, and the band will be sitting there getting all mad, going, "Why is that so open?" And after we're done playing, and and we like smack them around like a redheaded stepchild, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> and we really have a good fucking time doing it too. Which is great. I drove from Long Island for this. <laughs> you and Paul are going out. Actually, Why didn't Paul brought his check. Ooh. Right, wait, wait, one more, one more comment. On the European audience, Chris hit it on the head, there's not that much product over there. They don't have a whole hell of a lot of money, you know? So when they listen to a CD, they analyze every note, nuance, lyric thing. It got to the point where I think it was me and you, we went out to some club one night and, um, in Germany or one of those countries, and there was this Iron Maiden band playing, right? And it was an Iron Maiden tribute band, and they, they analyzed the record so much in the middle of one of the songs that actually said they, they were playing a version of um, Stranger and a Stranger. That was a live album. What's that? That was it. Yeah, it was a festival. Festival. And they said in the middle of the song, Thank you, San Jose! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So when we go out there and like I'll mess up a solo or I'll sing the wrong lyric or he plays a special version of All the Mountain King, we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Butter Ballet. That's it. The ballet. See, that's all your guys' fault, man. <laughs> You guys have implanted that now in me. I will fuck that song up for the rest of my career. You know, I'm looking at the goddamn key. I wrote this. I should be able to. There's no way I'm going to fuck it up this time. And they're all looking at me going, like, here he goes. Here he goes. <laughs> God damn it. Now it's like it's a joke. It's like they all say, no, wait a minute. One time we really paid attention to it because he got done singing the end of what was like Believe or when the crowds he got something like that. And he looks up and he goes to the audience. He goes, the old man still got it. And he goes to start another guy. It was like, ding, ding, twang. And these guys, now it's at the point where every time we play gutter ballet, I look over the corner of my eye and he's there with a cigarette. Him and this guy are standing there going like, on the side. it's like it's like in a fucking track or something. Like, I got ten on a leave of blowing it off. So it's like now they've been planted in my mind. So now it's like I know it's gonna be clank, 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 clank. Ah, like, oh, fuck. Now you know, never play that again because you guys have changed me forever. You can play it again and you'll screw it up forever. Yeah, but who cares? You know? Anyway, are we gonna play something? Yes. What are we playing? Um. Well, I guess. What are we doing? Paul. Uh, track of your choice from the new TSO. Oh, wow, cool. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh.